Andrew Womack Ministries presents part three in the Spirit, Soul, and Body series, a four-part album. This teaching by Andrew is titled, The Faith of God, Mind of Christ. We pray that the Word of God will come alive in your heart as you listen. This is tape number three in a four-tape series on Spirit, Soul, and Body. And we've already covered some life-changing truths, things that have just revolutionized my life and concepts that I believe the majority of people do not clearly understand, certainly to the point that they've put these elements together to form a overall philosophy or attitude towards what happened to us at salvation. And so if perchance you are just getting tape number three, I would encourage you to contact us and get the first two tapes because this really is revolutionary teaching. And what I'm going to be sharing today is based on the revelation about spirit, soul, and body. What I want to cover on this tape is to make two applications of this truth, how that our spirit is the part of us that is already completely changed. It's not in the process of being changed, but it's already completely perfect. As Jesus is, so are we in this world, 1 John 4, 17. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit, 1 Corinthians six seventeen, and that means a singular one to the exclusion of another. Our spirit is not in the process of growing and developing. Actually, it's our soul that's in the process of growing in its ability to comprehend and release the things that are already true in our spirit. Now, that is a radical truth. Again, if those questions haven't come up to you, if that doesn't seem like something that's important, then there isn't a full revelation of the things we've already covered on our first two tapes. On this tape, like I said, we're going to be covering the truth about how that we already have all of the faith that we will ever need. We don't need more faith from God. Our faith isn't small and immature and in the process of growing, but rather our faith is already as perfect and complete as the faith of Jesus. And the second thing I'll be covering on this tape is the same principle, but applied towards our revelation knowledge. The fact that in our spirit there is a mind in our spirit that already knows all things. And the rest of the Christian life is learning how to draw out the faith that was given to us at salvation and to draw out the mind of Christ that is in our born-again spirit. We already in our spirit have the complete measure of faith. We already have the mind of Christ. And as much as we will renew our mind, we can draw that wisdom out here. We can experience that faith and that wisdom in this life. And this is such radical truths that it would just totally revolutionize the lives of most people if they really thought that they already had the same faith that Jesus had. And if they already had the perfect mind of Christ and all it is is a matter of releasing it. I think that one of Satan's ploys, after he sees that you are going to commit your life to the Lord, and once you begin to start really hungering and thirsting for the things of the Lord, then once Satan sees that he can't stop you from desiring those things, he will push you so hard that he'll actually bring condemnation and frustration on you and say that you should have this. The very things that he told you you don't need and that they're useless and stay away from this, it'll ruin you. When he sees that he can't win that argument, he'll just switch over and go to condemning you and telling you you aren't operating enough in this. Your faith is too small. You are too stupid to comprehend the things of God. And he'll use those things against you. He tells us that faith doesn't work, that, you know, this faith stuff is foolish, and on and on and on it goes, all of his arguments against that. But when a person truly turns to the Lord, and they just know that this is real, and they know that faith can work miracles, faith can release and obtain things that the devil had told them couldn't done. When a person just gets that cemented on the inside of them and absolutely, totally convinced of it, then it's like the devil sees that he can't win that battle, so he just lets go and lets you go too far in the other direction, will actually start condemning you and telling you, sure, faith works. But the problem is, your faith is so small. Your faith is so inadequate. It'll work for other people, but it won't work for you. And, you know, that's one of the things that I want to dispel here. When I first really got turned on to the Lord, 
Of course, I've already shared some of this on our previous tapes, but I began to start really getting excited, and I mean serious about God. And when I read things in the Word, I knew that that wasn't just for those people back then, but it was for me now. And I started hungering to see those things, and of course, I hadn't seen them prior to that time. And I got so hungry for it, I saw that faith was the thing that really released the supernatural ability of God. And so I began a quest to start operating in God's kind of faith. And, of course, I misunderstood a number of things. And one of the foundational things that I missed was that I thought faith was something to be obtained. I thought you had to do things after salvation to get God to give you faith. And when I came up against some problem and felt like my faith was inadequate, I just embraced the thoughts that, well, yeah, faith works, but I just don't have any of it, or what I've got is too puny. And that's the attitude that I had. And the Lord revolutionized my life through sharing some things with me that are based on this teaching about spirit, soul, and body. Let me begin in Ephesians chapter 2, and in verse 8, a very familiar passage of Scripture. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, this verse is talking about how we obtain salvation. I don't think it's limited to just the forgiveness of our sins, the initial born-again experience. I believe that salvation applies to everything. Not only when you first walk in the door, but everything that's in that room, everything that God has accomplished through Jesus is a part of salvation. And so when it says, for by grace are you saved, this isn't just talking about the initial act when you first make Jesus your Lord and become born again, but it's really talking about healing, deliverance, prosperity, anything that you receive from God. It says, for by grace are you saved. That means healed, prospered, delivered, obtained joy, relationship, anything. It's the same thing. Even if you don't believe that, well, you could look at it this way. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, the scripture there says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. So that means the same principle that you use, or the same method of receiving that you use to get born again, is also the same method that you use to receive everything else, such as healing, deliverance, prosperity, etc. So any way you want to look at this, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, is saying that the way you receive from God is by grace through faith. And then it says, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, many people would interpret this as saying that that initial born-again experience is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. And I believe that that certainly is true, and I'm not saying that that verse doesn't say that. But again, I think it's too simplistic, it's too narrow to interpret salvation here as only the born-again experience. It actually applies to all of the things that we receive from God. The Greek word that's used for salvation is sozo, and it's applied to healing and prosperity and all kinds of things. So anyway, here's the point that I'm making. I'm not saying it's incorrect to say that our salvation was not of ourselves, that we were purchased through the blood of the Lord Jesus. We don't save ourselves. He saves us. And we put faith in that and receive it by faith. Now, I'm not saying that that's incorrect, but I think that also you could say that not only is the salvation not of ourselves, but the faith that we use to put in God's grace was not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. Now, again, you may interpret this verse in a more narrow focus than that, but that point is true. For instance, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, this again is a familiar passage of Scripture. Sometimes you get so familiar with Scripture and you see only one application of it that you can't really see that there's anything else. But in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, uh, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In other words, we receive our faith through God's Word. When it comes to the initial born-again experience, a person can't just believe in salvation without hearing the Word of God. They may not hear it quoted chapter and verse, but the truths, the concept that is in God's Word has to come across their path. They have to have the knowledge that Jesus died for our sins and that he in love offers us forgiveness independent of our actions. The only thing he demands is that we believe. 
Now, they have to have those truths. And when that word comes, God's word contains his faith, a supernatural faith. And that's how a person believes and receives. They have to hear the word because the word contains God's faith. And so when you get born again, it's not just human faith that you're using to believe for salvation, but it is a God-given supernatural faith that comes through hearing the gospel. God put his word, his faith, in his words. And then when those words are preached, as I'm doing right here on this tape, as I'm sharing truths with you, scriptures from God's word, it contains faith. And if you will open up your heart, that faith will enter in and it can produce salvation. It can release the ability of God. So the faith that a person uses to get born again is not their own faith. It's actually a faith that comes from God. And that's what Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 is talking about. Let me express it this way. The point I'm trying to make here, and the reason this is so important, is because if you believe that the faith you are using is a human faith, it's your natural faith, and you don't see it as a supernatural faith that came from God, that literally it's God's supernatural faith. If you don't see that, then you will allow the devil to convince you that, sure, faith works, but your faith isn't very good. It's puny. It's weak. It's frail. It's small in amount or in strength. But see, when you begin to understand that that's not so, it's not just your faith that you used when you got born again, but rather it was God's supernatural faith that was imparted unto you. If you can ever see that, if you get a revelation of that, it will change the way you feel about the faith that you use for salvation and therefore the faith that you use for everything else in your Christian life. You'll begin to recognize this isn't just human faith. It is supernatural faith. It has the ability to do things that will take me beyond just the physical, natural realm. I can begin to start seeing supernatural results instead of just human results because it's not a human faith. It is a supernatural faith. Now, I believe that God created mankind to be a faith being. And even before a person gets born again or separate from the influence of God, there still is a human or a natural type of faith. For instance, when I was a kid, I was brought up in church And I literally heard examples of people trying to explain faith. And they would take a chair and they would sit it there. And they would say that, you know what, it's faith that you could sit in this chair or sit on that pew. Because how do you know that that chair is going to hold you up? They would say that it's faith when you drive through a green light that you believe that the other side's got red showing towards them. You don't know it. You can't see it. You can't prove it. And even if the red is there, you still have faith that the other cars are going to stop. And they would say it's faith to ride in an airplane. How do you know? You don't know how a plane works. You don't know the pilot. How do you know that the mechanics of that plane are correct? So they would say that's faith. Well, it is a type of faith, but it's what I call a human faith. In other words, it's based on sense knowledge. It's based on facts. It's based on something that you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. For instance, go back to the illustration of a chair. If I put a chair there and I asked you to sit in it, whether you were really conscious of it or not, the very first thing you would do is glance at that chair, and you would see if it had all four legs there. For instance, if the chair only had three legs and the thing was leaning over and it was just teetering and you could see that it was about to fall, you wouldn't sit in a chair if your sense knowledge told you that it was about to fall over. So whether you realize it or not, if you sit down in a chair, you look at that chair first. You inspect it. It may not be a perfect inspection, but you do have some sense knowledge that you are basing your action upon. If you drive through a green light at an intersection, you have been trained. You have, you've been on the other side to where you see the lights turn red. You have experience to base that on. You also glance. When I go through an intersection, I just don't take things for granted. I do glance the other direction and see if there's anybody that looks like they're fixing to speed and break that light. I think that's a wise thing to do. If you were to get on a plane that you could look out and see that one of the wings was gone, you would not fly on that plane. If you could see that there was a wreck at an intersection prior to you going through it, you would not just go through on that green line. If you could see that the chair only had three legs and it looked like it was going to fall apart, you would not sit in a chair like that based on 
on just human faith because human faith is limited to what it can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. If the facts don't seem to support the action, you cannot act contrary when you're using just a human faith. A human faith is limited by things that it can see. But let me share a passage of Scripture with you about God's kind of faith, the supernatural faith that you used when you got born again. In Romans chapter 4 and in verse 17, as it is written, and I'm breaking right into the midst of a sentence here, but I think that the point will still be well taken. It says, I have made thee a father of many nations. This is God talking to Abraham. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, that means gives life to the dead, and calls those things which be not as though they are. In other words, God, specifically, this is talking about in Genesis chapter 15, when God changed Abram's name. And when God told him, had this covenant with him, and then changed his name and promised him that he would have a child, he backed it up by changing his name, and God literally called Abraham the father of many nations before he had a child. And what this is illustrating, the reason this is quoted in Romans chapter 4, is to illustrate the way God's faith operates. God calls those things which aren't yet manifest. There is no physical evidence or proof for it. God calls those things as if they were before there is any physical proof. In other words, human faith follows sense knowledge. Supernatural faith precedes sense knowledge. Supernatural faith literally brings things into existence. Human faith or natural faith only acknowledges and responds to what it can already see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. Radical difference. And see, when it comes to getting born again, you had to use a supernatural faith, not a natural faith, because you were believing for things that you could not see, taste, hear, smell, or feel. They were beyond your sense knowledge. For instance, you were believing in the existence of God. You, weren't, you didn't have it proven to you that God exists. Now, there may be somebody listening to me who had a vision or some type of an audible voice, but that certainly is not the normal. When I got born again, when most people make a commitment of their life to the Lord, it's not because of tangible proof. It's because of the Holy Spirit just enlightening them, speaking to their heart, revelation coming to them, and they're taking a step of faith that isn't based on what they can see, taste, hear, smell, or feel. It's based on the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And so, see, you have to believe in God whom you cannot see. You also believe in the devil. You also believe in God's kingdom. You also believe in Satan's kingdom, which you can't see any of those things. You believe that there are sins, which you can't see a sin. I mean, you can, t you can see when a person commits a sin. But the sin itself, what does it look like? And what does it look like when a sin's forgiven? See, you were involved in all of these things. You believed in heaven, which you have not seen. You also believe there was a hell to shun, which you have not seen. All of these were faith issues that could not be verified and proven by just human faith. So this is the point I'm wanting to get across. When you got born again, you were given God's supernatural faith. You couldn't get born again without it. You couldn't get born again just using human faith based on reason because you had to believe for things that were beyond our ability to prove or disprove. So you used God's supernatural faith. It was imparted unto you, as Romans ten seventeen says, through hearing the word of God. And here is a radical truth. And that is that this faith was imparted into your spirit. And that faith doesn't lose its potency. It doesn't evaporate. It doesn't diminish. It doesn't get old and lose its power. But that faith is still exactly the same in your spirit. The same faith that you used when you got born again is always present in your spirit. It may not be present in your soul and in your body. Your mind not, might not be under the influence of that faith, and it may not be releasing that faith. Your body may not be under the influence of that faith and receiving the benefit of it. But in your spirit, if you've been born again, you already have the supernatural faith of God. Let me use a scripture to uh, just go along with this. In Galatians chapter 5 
and verse 22. The scripture there says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit. In other words, in the Spirit is where faith comes from. Another scripture to go along with this is over in Romans chapter 10, verse 10. It says, For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. Faith, belief, is a product of the heart, not just the mind, but it comes from deep within. It's actually, for the born-again believer, faith has been put into your born-again spirit. Now, this reinforces a lot of the points that I made on the first two tapes, that in your spirit you are right this moment the way that Jesus is, 1 John four seventeen. Well, how do you think that Jesus is? Well, certainly Jesus is in faith. Jesus is operating in faith perfectly. And your born-again spirit has the faith of God in it perfectly. There is no lack or inadequacy. You don't need more faith. What you need is to believe that you already have faith. Acknowledge that. Begin to go to God's Word. Find out what are the laws that govern how faith works and begin to start cooperating with them and using them to your advantage. And then you'll find out that the faith that is already on the inside of you is more than sufficient for any problem that you have. Let me give you some other scriptures to help verify this same thing. The Apostle Paul said this in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. It says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Notice it didn't say faith in Jesus Christ. It'll say that in this same verse. But technically, it's saying that you are justified by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ. There it is. We believe in Jesus, but it goes on to say that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Did you know that actually, here's the way that it is. When a person comes to the Lord, sin has so totally uh, destroyed us before we get born again. Sin is such a master. It has totally destroyed our ability. We can't even reach out and receive the salvation that God has purchased for us just on our own ability. Our minds, our hearts, before we get born again, are so corrupted that there's just no way that we could really believe and receive it because we are blinded. We are separated from God through our sins. There's many scriptures that go along with this. So the Lord not only provided salvation through Jesus dying for our sins, making all of the atonement, doing everything that was necessary, but then he also offers us his faith. I mean, he provides the salvation, but then he also provides us with the faith to believe and receive that salvation. God has to speak his word to us through someone, and through that word comes his supernatural faith, and we get born again. That's what it's saying here in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Twice it says we are justified by the faith of Jesus, not faith in Jesus. Technically, it's not just our human faith, but it is God's faith that we hear through the word, then we embrace it, use his faith to receive his gift of salvation. Man, that's wonderful. And then it goes on, to, Paul went on to say in verse 20, this is just a few verses down, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. He did not say I'm living by faith in the Son of God, but he says I'm living by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, Paul here is saying that he lived a life that was by the faith of the Son of God. And then in verse 16, twice, he says, we are justified by the faith of Christ. Man, that makes it very clear that it is not just a human faith that receives from God, but God literally imparts to us his supernatural faith. And it's just like everything else that's in the Spirit. I've already established this on the previous two tapes, that the things that are reality in the Spirit, they don't fluctuate based on our performance. They don't lose their potency, their power. They're consistent. They're eternal. 
And that same thing is true of faith. We got born again using the supernatural faith of God, and that faith is always, always, always in our spirit. Now, we don't need to just leave it there. We need to get it out into our soul and into our body, but the very first step is believing that it is in your spirit. You know, a verse that I've already used is uh, Philemon chapter 1, and verse 6, it says, The communication of your faith becomes effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ. It says there that your faith begins to be effective. It begins to work when you acknowledge the good things that are in you. And in the context of what we're talking about here, the thing you've got to acknowledge is that God has already given you his faith. You don't have a faith deficiency. You have a knowledge problem. You don't know what you've got. You haven't acknowledged it yet. You haven't learned the laws that govern faith. If we don't acknowledge it and begin to learn these laws, the how faith works, then we will not see that faith manifest, but not because we don't have it, but rather because we don't know how to use it. Here in Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, Paul said this, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man. And this, by context, if you study it out, this is talking about every born-again man, every person who has confessed him as Lord. It says God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. It did not say a measure of faith. Some people teach that. I think that there are actually some versions that will talk about a measure of faith. But the point here, and the point that I'm making, which is verified in, in uh, Galatians 2.16 and Galatians 2.20, is that it is not just a measure of faith. When you got born again, you didn't get given just a little bit of faith, and other people were given huge faith. And you have to do something. No, all of us were given the measure of faith. You know, if I was, like, for instance, dishing out soup in a soup line, and if you came by, if there was a whole line of people, and if I had a ladle, and if I used that same ladle to dip out everybody's soup, well, then that would be the measure, and everybody would get the same amount. But if, you know, I was to use a ladle one time for one person and then a teaspoon for another one and then a tablespoon for another one, and if every time I use some kind of different measure, well, then that's the way most people uh, believe that it was when we got born again, that God just gives some people more than other people. But no, that's not what this verse is saying. God dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, it's important that you get this. If you just look on the external, there is no doubt about it that some people operate in more faith than others. And if all you do is look at the external, you'll think, well, then they've got more faith than I've got. Well, they've got more faith out in the physical realm than you've got. In other words, they are using more faith maybe than what you've got. But according to the scripture, every one of us was given the measure of faith. Now, put this back with Galatians 2.20, the scripture that we just used. And it's Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Not faith in the Son of God, but the faith of the Son of God. Now, that means that Paul was using the faith of Jesus. He's saying, I'm living by the same faith that Jesus used when he walked on this earth. Romans 12, 3 says, every one of us was given the measure of faith. There aren't varying measures, varying amounts. So if Paul lived by the faith of the Son of God, then that means that you and I, every person who is born again like Paul, also has the faith of the Son of God. Praise God, what a radical truth. I tell you, if you could believe and grasp what I'm saying right here, this would just change your expectancy level. If you understood that when you got born again, you were given the faith of the Son of God, and it's all in there. It's just a matter of drawing it out. Even if you didn't understand at this moment how to release that faith, just the knowledge that it's there, the potential that you have on the inside would provide you with so much motivation that you wouldn't quit until you saw it manifest. 
Most people are not really pursuing the things of God and studying the Word and learning how to work the kingdom because the truth is they just don't believe that even if they learn those laws, it's just like they feel that I don't have what it takes. You'll find so many people praying for more faith. You don't need more faith. What you need is to believe that you've already got the faith of God, figure out how it works and cooperate and release what you've already gotten. Here's another scripture that goes along with that. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and of our Savior Jesus Christ. Now here's the apostle Peter writing to a group of people, and he says, you have obtained. That means it's already present tense. It's not something they are searching for, seeking after. It says you've already obtained it. That means you've already got it. And how did you get it? Through being holy and through doing these things? No, it says through the righteousness of God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, it's saying that when you got born again, you received faith. Just the same point that I've been making. And this is the same Peter that when he walked down the street in Acts chapter 4 and his shadow fell on people that they were healed instantly. This is the same Peter that raised Dorcas from the dead. This is the same Peter that walked on water. It's the same Peter that saw all of these great things happen, 3,000 people born again on the day of Pentecost. And he says, you have like precious faith. Now, if you don't believe that, then you might as well tear Second Peter out of your Bible because he was writing to people that have obtained like precious faith with him. If you don't have like precious faith, then Second Peter doesn't apply to you. But the truth is that if you're truly born again, Second Peter does apply to you because you have the same faith that Peter had. Because Peter wasn't operating in his faith. It wasn't just the fact that Peter was an apostle and Peter had walked with Jesus and somehow or another that endued him with more faith than you. No, he had been given the measure of faith. It was the faith of Jesus. And just like Paul, he was living by the faith of the Son of God. You can live by the faith of the Son of God. I have the same faith that Jesus has. Now, I don't have it all operating the way that Jesus did. Jesus, his soul, I use this example prior to this tape, but your soul is kind of like a filter or a screen that the spirit has to flow through to get into the physical realm. And all of our thoughts and concepts that are crossways and contrary to the revelation of God's Word, well, they filter out some of that. And the fact is, some of us, our thoughts are so screwed up that, you know, there's just very little of the Spirit able to get through our soul and manifest. In this area of the faith of God, some of us are just able to release a very little faith of God. And as far as our actions and results go, we may not be seeing much happen. But the truth is that if you are truly born of God, you have the faith of the Son of God already living on the inside of you. And as you renew your mind, it's like increasing the size of that filter, that screen, so that more and more of the Spirit, more and more of the faith of Christ that is already in you can get out. Now, I'm not a perfect example on this, but, you know, I have seen a tremendous, tremendous increase of God's faith in my life. I've seen people raised from the dead, blind eyes open, deaf ears open. I've operated in the gifts of the Spirit and been able to say things that are just totally beyond anything that I could have perceived in the natural realm. It was the Spirit within flowing out of me. And it takes faith to tell people what their name is. I've actually done that. I've told people things that are wrong with them, sicknesses and diseases, things that are going on in their marriage, etc., etc., and it takes faith. It's God's supernatural faith. I don't manifest it perfectly, but I have seen such an increase that I can tell you that the benefit and the positive results that I have seen are because I've believed that I already have that faith. I'm not trying to get more faith. I'm trying to release the faith that I already have. You know, I heard Reinhard Bonnke interviewed on the 700 Club one time, and Pat Robertson was talking to him, and then they opened it up to questions in the audience. And one of the questions was that they asked Reinhard Bonnke, they said, why do you see so many more healings in third world countries than we see here in the United States? It says, is it because they have more faith? 
And man, when I heard that question, my ears perked up because I wanted to hear what his answer was. And his answer was really interesting. He said, you know, that's an invalid question. He said Americans are the only people on the face of the earth that he had encountered who have this concept of more faith or little faith. He says in other countries you either believe or you don't believe. But Americans have this concept of varying degrees and believe that you have to hit level 10 or 20 or whatever, you know, before your faith begins to work. And that really violates the concepts that Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20 and 21, where it says if your faith is just like a grain of mustard seed, you could cast a mountain into the sea and it would obey you. You could just speak to it and it would work. And here's the point, that you really don't have more faith than little faith. You might have more faith operative. You might be manifesting more faith, totally dependent on whether or not you've renewed your mind. But no one was given more faith or less faith than another. We were all given the measure of faith from Christ at salvation. Man, if you understand that, what a revelation. What a difference that would make in your life. It would motivate you. It would provide you with so much motivation if you really knew that, man, I have the faith of Christ in me, the same faith that he used when he raised Lazarus from the dead. That's available to me. It's just a matter of renewing my mind. I've got that power, that anointing, that potential in my spirit. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Man, your spirit is already perfect and complete. The same faith that Jesus used when he walked on this earth, the same faith that Paul used, the same faith that Peter used, you have that same faith if you're born again. It's already on the inside of you, and all you got to do to get it to be effectual to start working is start acknowledging that you have it. That's the very first step. Now, there's other things to it, but that's the point I want to get across here, that in your spirit you already have the faith of the Son of God in your spirit completely. The second application I want to make from this teaching on spirit, soul, and body on this tape is about the mind of Christ. That when you got born again, you have a mind in your spirit. Now, for instance, in Ephesians chapter 4, I believe it's verse 23, it says, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's talking about the way you think. But your spirit, your born-again spirit also has a mind because it says this over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. It says, Who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This born-again spirit that I've spent these three tapes talking about, this spirit was created with intelligence. You have a physical mind in your soulish realm. That's your brain. That's the part of you that you educate. When you come into this world, you come as a child, and you honestly don't know anything. You have some automatic functions of the mind. It teaches you how to breathe, you know, your body, your heart pumps. There's some things that are automatic, but your mind has to be educated. You don't come out of the womb talking. You don't come out of the womb walking. You have to train yourself and coordinate your muscles, and the mind is involved in that. Uh, your intellect, all of these kind of things have to be developed. Input has to be put into it. But you know what? You also, when you got born again, you had a mind in your spirit. And that's what it's talking about. We have the mind of Christ. Now, that's not manifest in your little physical brain that's inside your skull. But in your spirit, man, you have a mind, the mind of Christ. And it doesn't have to be trained and taught. It's born again in perfect knowledge. You already have the mind of Christ. Now, somebody might say, well, wait a minute. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it talks about now we only know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away. I will know all things, even as also I am known. That's talking about your soulish realm, the physical mind. And right now, we don't understand everything with our physical mind. We are in the process of renewing it, and I don't think any person ever completely arrives in that process. We just leave. We start. But in your spirit, you do have the mind of Christ. Again, this is the only way to understand this scripture. If you're saying, oh, well, no, this means that in my mind, my physical mind, I have the mind of Christ, 
Well, there's nobody that could defend that position because I can guarantee you that there are things that the Lord Jesus knows that you don't know in your physical mind. There are even things that the Lord knew in the Word that are recorded for us that we don't know. Some of his sayings. I don't think there's anybody listening to me that you could claim that you understand every single thing that he said, that you've got total revelation of it, that you have fullness of understanding. I mean, we can prove that in our actions. Our actions don't back that up. You cannot see the mind of Christ in your physical brain, but your spirit has a mind. Your spirit was born again with intellect, and you have a mind in your spirit. See, this is the reason that the Bible talks about not being double-minded. You know, there's a number of places that it talks about this. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, in James chapter 4. You know, there's just a number of scriptures that talk about double-mindedness. Well, that's because we have a mind in our spirit, and we have a mind in our head, our physical brain. And the key to the Christian life is getting those two to agree. Again, I go back to my very first tape on this subject. You have three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit is always, always in agreement with God. Your body, it's basically under the influence of physical things, what it can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. Your soul is the deciding factor, and specifically your mind, the way you think about things. If you get your mind into agreement with the spirit, then that's being single-minded. In other words, your mind is thinking the same way that the mind in your spirit is thinking. When you do that, then that's believing with all of your heart, and you will see the power of God manifest. But on the other hand, if you have your mind, your physical brain, contrary in its thinking to what God says about you, well, then it'll be a double mind. It'll be different than the way your spirit thinks. Your spiritual mind is always thinking the way that God thinks. The Word of God gives us a perfect representation of how you are thinking in your spirit. Your spirit is saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, out of Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. So your spirit can do all things. That's what it's thinking. If your mind gets into agreement with that, then you know what? You will see supernatural power and ability flow through your soul into your physical body, into your physical existence, and you'll see the results. But if your mind is contrary to that, saying, I can't do all things. Man, I can't, I can't beat this sickness. I've known five people who died of this same thing, and the doctor says it's hopeless. And if that's the way you think, then that's being double-minded. And it says that a double-minded man shall receive nothing of the Lord in James chapter 1. Verse 5, it says, You know, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. This basically is where the conflict in the Christian life is. Your spirit is always thinking according to God's word. You have the mind of Christ in your spirit. But your soul doesn't automatically think that way. It takes effort to renew the mind and to get the physical mind to where it agrees with the spiritual mind. When you do that, you're single-minded. When you don't do that, you're double-minded. And it says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. He won't receive anything of the Lord. See, now again, this goes so contrary to the typical belief of most Christians. Most Christians believe that when they got born again, because they can't see the change in their physical body, and because they can't perceive it in their soulish realm just automatically, therefore they think that the real change is just on paper. It's not an actual experience. Nothing in actuality has changed except for our future. And when we get to heaven, then everything's going to be awesome. And then we're going to know all things and all of these kind of things. Well, it's true that when we get to heaven, that's when it's going to be completed. But your spirit right now has the mind of Christ in it, and it knows all things, everything. If you could really believe that, 
Again, this would keep us from just pushing into this defeated mode to where, well, I know that God can do it, but man, I just don't understand the things of God. And so we embrace ignorance and actually write songs about someday it'll be better. Someday all of these things will be better. But now we glorify these things. I'm just a poor wayfaring pilgrim and we wail and travail and glorify our infirmities and embrace them and take solace in the fact that, well, I'm just so inadequate. I, I can't experience victory until I go to be with the Lord. That's not true. And that happens because people don't realize that in your spirit, you're already a totally brand new person and you already have the mind of Christ. That's what it says there in First Corinthians chapter 2. And verse 16, it says that you have the mind of Christ. But in 1 John chapter 2 and in verse 20, the scripture says this. It says, you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. This word unction means an anointing, a special endowment with power or an ability from the Holy One, talking about Jesus, and you know all things. Now, again, people, if you don't understand spirit, soul, and body, and that in the spirit is where you're changed, and in the spirit is where you are like Jesus, in the spirit is where you have the mind of Christ. If you don't understand that, people will read a verse like this. It says, you know all things. And they'll just throw up their hands and say, man, the Bible is so hard to understand. I can prove by my last test score that I don't know all things. I can prove by the fact that I forgot where I put my keys today. I walked into a room to do something, couldn't even remember why I came in there. Man, I can prove to you I don't know all things. Well, if you're just trying to find this reality that you have the mind of Christ in your physical brain, which is in the soulish realm, then no, you will never accept and embrace this truth that you have the mind of Christ. But according to this scripture, it says you know all things. The way to understand that is that that's in your spirit. In your spirit where you have the mind of Christ, and that mind of Christ knows all things. Not some things, but all things. Actually, in the Greek, what the word all means, it means the exclusion of nothing. This means you know all things. Everything that Jesus knows, you know because you have the mind of Christ. Now, somebody may be listening to me and saying, well... I can see these scriptures that I've got the mind of Christ and it says that I know all things, but if it's in my spirit, what good does it do me? How do you get it out into the physical realm? Well, let me just share some things with you. First of all, the most important thing is you cannot release something until you believe you've already got it. If you waver in the fact that you already have the mind of Christ and that you know all things, then I can promise you the effort it takes to release that in the process, Satan will come to you and he will tempt you and make you just think, oh, it doesn't work. What that guy said isn't true. What the Word says isn't true. It doesn't work. And unless you're absolutely convinced of this point, you'll get frustrated and quit before you see the manifestation of it. So I cannot overemphasize the fact that you must believe that you already have the mind of Christ and that in your spirit it's complete. It doesn't matter if you mess up. You still have the mind of Christ in you. You have to believe that. That's the first step. But if you do believe that, well, then there are things that you can do that will draw out that wisdom. Let me just share one thing with you, and there's many. Uh, it ought to go without saying that studying the Word of God will release that wisdom. Because, see, when you're reading the Word of God, what you're doing is you're reading that with your, your physical eyes. You're taking that knowledge into your soulish realm and as you have new thoughts and new ideas come to your physical mind, then the spirit man who already has the truth and the mind of Christ will bear witness with that and say, yes. And when that happens, I don't know if any of you, it's hard for me to describe. I don't know how to describe things that are intangible and going on on the inside. But I think most of you will understand that sometimes you've read a scripture and it's just like that scripture. All of a sudden you saw it. You may have read it a dozen times, a hundred times before, but all of a sudden you see it. It's like, yes, and everything within you is saying yes. You know what that is? That's the spirit and the soul becoming of one mind. When your soulish realm gains a truth and begins to embrace it and think, yes, well, then the spirit connects with that and agrees. And when that connection is made, 
man, it just goes off on the inside of you. It becomes revelation. It's truth. It's reality. You don't have to have necessarily somebody come by and prove it to you. You know it because there is a witness on the inside. And there are many scriptures that talk about this, about that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God, First John chapter 5. And that same principle is said in many different places in Scripture. So it ought to go without saying that studying of God's Word is just vital for you getting your soulish mind to agree with your physical mind and drawing that truth out. When that truth comes into the soulish realm, then the spirit truth, that spirit mind of Christ that agrees perfectly with the Bible, they just mesh. It's like they become one, and you become of one mind. That just draws that knowledge that's in your spirit that already existed. It draws it out into the physical realm and allows it to start having its influence and impact in the physical realm. Real quickly, let me just share with you another really powerful way of releasing this mind of Christ that is in your spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, in verse 1, it says, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto man, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Notice this terminology. When you are praying in tongues, it says that in the Spirit you are speaking mysteries. When you are praying in tongues, it's your spirit praying. As a matter of fact, it goes on down and says it in those exact terms down here in verse 14. It says, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Now see, this is showing these two minds. You have a mind, the mind of Christ that's in your spirit, and it says when you're praying in tongues, your spirit prays. But your understanding, that's talking about in the soulish, physical realm, your your little peanut brain is unfruitful. So this shows these two brains in operations, two minds. You have the mind of Christ in your spirit, and when you're praying in tongues, it's that spirit that's praying, the mind of Christ that's praying. But your physical mind in the soulish realm is unfruitful. And then again, back in verse 2, it says that in the spirit you are speaking mysteries. In verse 3 it says, But he that prophesies speaketh unto man to exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. In verse 4 it says that you edify. The word edify means to build up or promote spiritual growth. It is not your spirit that is growing. It's your soul that's actually growing. Your spirit is already perfect and complete. As Jesus is, so are you. We aren't trying to get the Word of God into our spirits because in our spirit we already have the mind of Christ and we know all things. What we're trying to do is get the Word of God into our soul and let the spirit bear witness with it. And then if the soulish realm, that physical mind, will embrace that truth and say, yes, God, this is what I believe. I'm throwing out all other thoughts, all other belief systems, contrary, and this truth is going to rule my life. When you do that, well, then the soul and the spirit's way of thinking unite, and you become of one mind, and that's when you start seeing the power of God manifest. And it edifies you. It builds you up because you are drawing that wisdom and knowledge that's in your spirit out into the physical realm. So according to these scriptures, when you are praying in tongues, your spirit is praying. And it's praying the hidden wisdom of God is what it says. It says again in verse 2, it says, When you speak in an unknown tongue, you speak not unto man, but unto God. No man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. What are those mysteries? Well, let's look back in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Remember, this is where we started talking about the mind of Christ. It says 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16 that we have the mind of Christ. Paul started out this second chapter talking about that when he came preaching to the Corinthians, he wasn't just using his intellect, but rather he was using the power of God, the demonstration. And in a process of trying to explain this, he actually was putting down carnal knowledge, just physical, learned knowledge, the kind of knowledge you get when you go to school. 
Here's what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. In verse 6 he says, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. In other words, there is a wisdom that comes out of the Spirit from the mind of Christ, and then there is a wisdom that comes from your physical brain that you learn in school or somebody teaches you. And it's only the wisdom that comes from the Spirit that will really allow you to relate to God. Because with your physical little peanut brain, you just cannot understand the things of God. You have to understand that through the Spirit, man. That's what he's talking about. So again, in verse 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Paul is saying that what he preached was the hidden wisdom of God in a mystery. Now, I'm going to go back to 1 Corinthians 14, but let me just point out one other thing before we leave. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It says in verse 9, it says, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now, some people have heard this verse, and they say, Well, now, brother, this contradicts what you're saying. This says, I haven't seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for him. See, that just shows that you cannot really know the things of God. We just really don't know. That's, that's a verse that proves it. Well, if you go on to the very next verse, it says, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man, etc. And it goes on, it says, We have now received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And he goes on and winds up in verse 16 by saying, We have the mind of Christ. In other words, this was an Old Testament scripture quoted saying, I hath not seen, nor ear is heard. And the Old Testament man, see, weren't born again. They didn't have a new born-again spirit. And so it's totally accurate and true to say that an Old Testament man or a person who is not born again can not understand the things of God because they're foolishness unto him. They have to be spiritually discerned. That's what verse 14, 1 Corinthians 2 says. And so that's totally accurate to say that. But it's inaccurate to say that that's the way it is for a New Testament believer. Because we now have a spirit of Christ on the inside of us that has the mind of Christ, and now we can know things. So when people use 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, to say that you know we can't understand the things of God, that is not accurate because that was an Old Testament scripture, and what he's doing is contrasting this and showing that we have something much greater. And we now have something greater than the Old Testament saints did and we can now understand the things of God. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 there, Paul said he was speaking wisdom, but it wasn't the wisdom of this world, but it was the hidden wisdom of God in a mystery. Now again, look back in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto man, but unto God, for no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. When you're praying in tongues, you are praying the wisdom of God in a mystery, which is what Paul said he was preaching unto those people. Now, we know from his own teaching that he didn't preach in tongues. But what he was saying is he was speaking the wisdom of God, the same thing when he preached in English. It was things that he had learned through praying in tongues and speaking this hidden wisdom of God. Now, I don't believe that's the only way he learned it. I'm not saying that we just speak in tongues and then whatever comes to your mind, you start saying it. But I'm saying that speaking in tongues, according to 1 Corinthians 14:14, 14, 14, it says when you pray in an unknown tongue, your spirit prays. 
Your spirit is a part of you that has this perfect mind of Christ and knows all things. When you are studying the Word of God, you need to pray in tongues. And as you do, you are releasing this mind of Christ. And it will release what I call revelation knowledge. In other words, that means knowledge that's not just taught to you by somebody teaching you this is the way it is. But you will read Scripture, and then the Holy Spirit on the inside of you will quicken your spirit, and it will bear witness with that truth, and it'll just become alive. It becomes a revelation. In other words, it's not something that you're necessarily taught, but it's a revelation. For instance, over in the book of Luke, chapter 1, it talks about, uh, or chapter 2, it talks about Simeon coming in at the very time that Joseph and Mary had brought Jesus into the temple to circumcise him and offer their sacrifice for her cleansing. And it says that Simeon came into the temple. It had been revealed unto him by the Holy Spirit that he should not die until he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, there's nobody who could tell him that. Nobody had preached that to him. He didn't go to some book and read it. It was a revelation. It came through his spirit. God just revealed it unto him. And see, this is what I call revelation knowledge. You may be reading the word and studying it and looking things up in the Greek and cross-referencing it and maybe reading somebody else's opinion about what the Word says. But, man, all of a sudden, when you're born-again spirit that has the mind of Christ on the inside of you, just it's like it reaches out and grabs a truth and says, yes, this one is true. This is for you. That's revelation knowledge. It came from the Spirit instead of from the outside in. It came from the inside out. And so when you're praying in tongues, your spirit is praying. And in 1 Corinthians 14, 13, it says, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Now, I will admit that this is primarily giving instructions about how the gift of speaking in tongues should operate in the church. But it's not limited to that, because Paul said in this same chapter, he says, I speak in tongues more than you all. But in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So he was talking primarily about how the gift operated in the church, but he did bring in some personal examples and mention about how speaking in tongues worked in his personal life. And so the point that I'm making is that in a church service, if you pray in tongues, there should be an interpretation. And I agree with that. But it's the same thing when you're at home. When you're speaking in tongues, it's the mind of Christ praying through you. And according to this verse, you should pray that you interpret. I believe that you can interpret your tongue even when you aren't in a church. When you're just speaking in tongues, it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 4, it says that you edify yourself when you pray in tongues. You build yourself up. And so it's beneficial whether you get an interpretation or not. It also says in Isaiah chapter 28 that when you speak in tongues, it's the rest whereby you cause the weary to rest. It will release stress. It will release the peace of God, and it'll just give you rest and refreshing. So there is benefit to speaking in tongues whether you ever interpret it or not. But according to these verses, you can interpret it. And I can tell you that in my own personal life, that I started interpreting my speaking in tongues. And it has been part of the way that God showed me these truths about spirit, soul, and body and things like that. When I first got really turned on to the Lord, I've already explained this on the previous tapes, but I went through a period of having an experience where there was an excitement and an anointing and a stirring on the inside, but my mind just could not comprehend it. And then I began to start seeing little lights of little truths when I was in Vietnam studying the Word. When I got back to the States, and especially after Jamie and I got married in October of 1972, I just started pouring over the Word of God, and Scripture started coming alive to me. It was like I was saying, in my spirit there was a rejoicing. I'd read certain Scriptures, and the spirit on the inside of me was just wanting to stand up and shout. But my mind still didn't understand it. It was contrary to the way that I'd been taught. And I struggled with it. And so I just determined that I was going to break through this. And one of the things that I did, I spent sometimes as much as 10 hours a day just sitting down with a legal pad of paper and a pen, and I would write these scriptures out. I had four or five pages with nothing but just scriptures written out 
longhand. And I do this every day because as I wrote the words, I would stop and meditate on each individual word. And if I got through my list, I'd go back over it and do it again. And then after I'd done that for maybe six hours, eight hours, ten hours, whatever, I would literally go into a little closet in our apartment in Dallas, Texas. Actually, it was in Garland, Texas, suburb of Dallas. And I would go into my little closet and I would lock myself in there. And for one hour or more, I would just pray in tongues based on these scriptures that it was my spirit praying. And my spirit is where this mind of Christ was. And I knew that the spirit on the inside already had revelation of these truths. And as I prayed in tongues, I was asking God to interpret this to my mind to help me understand these scriptures I was reading. And many of the things that you know I'm sharing with you on this series about spirit, soul, and body, the way I got that understanding is I took these scriptures, wrote them down, meditated on it, and then I'd pray over them. And as I prayed, uh, it actually took a number of months before I began to start making the connections because, boy, my thinking was so screwed up from all my religious thinking. But after a couple of months of doing this, I mean just all of a sudden, it seems like in one week's time, God began to start putting some of this together. And I began to get a revelation of spirit, soul, and body, how God could love me. The truths that we shared on the tape entitled Eternal Life, they became reality to me. These things just exploded on the inside of me, so much so that after about a week of that, I literally asked God to uh, slow down the revelation because it was coming so fast and furious that I couldn't comprehend it all. I knew I wasn't going to be able to retain it, and I, want, I didn't want to miss anything. But see, this is one of the ways that it happened. I prayed for an interpretation. Now, that needs a lot more explanation. There are some potential problems with this. If a person takes what I'm saying here and just starts praying in tongues and asking God for an interpretation and then whatever thoughts come to them, they take that as being God, I think that you could get into some serious trouble doing that because just because you pray in tongues doesn't guarantee that you are pure Holy Ghost and under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost because in the very book we're reading here, 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul rebuked the Corinthians for the way they had used the gift of speaking in tongues. Actually, these statements that he's making in chapter 12 and chapter 14 are uh, corrections to the people because they had gotten carnal in their speaking in tongues. Now, speaking in tongues is the Spirit praying. But you can pray in tongues and still have negative, wrong thoughts come to you. It's the point I'm trying to make. And so it's not accurate to say just pray in tongues and whatever comes to your mind, that's the interpretation. No, I think that's a recipe for disaster. But you have to judge every thought that you have, everything by the Word of God. The Spirit and the Word agree is what it says in 1 John chapter 5. There is no disagreement. The Spirit, uh, or let me say it this way, the Word of God never will contradict the Spirit, spiritual truth. And so, if you pray in tongues, and if you get some thoughts that are contrary to God's Word, well, then you just need to say, well, that's not God. I don't care if you are speaking in tongues. But if you are praying in tongues and asking for revelation and if thoughts come to you and all of a sudden you say well I've never thought that and you can go back and find it and verify it in the word of God and say yes this is exactly what it's saying why didn't I see that before and you can find it in more than just one obscure place but I mean it's an obvious truth from the word of God after the revelation comes then it becomes obvious and you can find it well then I would go with that and say yes that is the spirit that quickened that to you and so there are some qualifications and some things. Uh, basically, you need to know God's Word to be able to do this. This may not be true, or it may not be the way that an immature Christian should operate. I don't think that you ought... If you'll notice my illustration I gave, I was spending sometimes six to ten hours a day studying the Scriptures, and then I'd spend one hour praying in tongues for revelation. I don't think that you ought to spend one hour studying the Word and ten hours praying in tongues. It ought to be the opposite. But it is a truth. And God has revealed a lot of things to me through this. I could give a lot of examples, but I just don't have time on this tape. But really, these truths that I've shared on spirit, soul, and body, they came through the Word. Everything I've been sharing with you, I've shared from Scripture 
But the reason those scriptures have come alive to me and have impacted my life where they may not have impacted some other people's life is because I mixed it with praying in tongues. So if you need more information on this, I have a tape entitled Revelation Knowledge that will teach the same point but go into more detail. It's an hour and a half worth of teaching, whereas I've only spent about 30-something minutes teaching about it on this tape. And it will tell you about how to do that, how to interpret it, checks and balances, and some other things. So I'd encourage you to get that tape. But the point I'm trying to make here is that in your spirit, you have the mind of Christ. And you know all things, according to 1 John chapter 2. And so that wisdom, the perfect, pure wisdom of God is in your spirit. And if you could just study like the book of Proverbs and see what it says about the person who has wisdom and has understanding, that in, you know, in, in the right hand are riches and honor and life forevermore. I mean, these are the key. It says wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all of your getting, get understanding. If you just studied the book of Proverbs, you'd find out that, man, wisdom, knowledge is to be more desired than gold, more than anything else, because it will get for you everything that you need and all of this other. Wisdom is so important. And if you could understand that when you got born again, God imparted unto you perfect wisdom perfect revelation. It's already in your spirit. You aren't trying to get the word into your spirit. You're trying to get the word into your soulish realm so that your spirit can bear witness with it and you can become of one mind in your between your soul and your spirit. And when that happens, it just opens up a floodgate for the truths and the reality that are already in your spirit to come flooding out into your soulish mind and through it into your physical body and into the physical realm. Man, this is one of the great keys. And, you know, this underscores how important the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. Someone might listen to my teaching on spirit, soul, and body, find out that in your spirit you are sanctified and perfected forever, Hebrews 10, verses 10 and 14, that you already have everything. As Jesus is, so are you in this world, 1 John 4, 17, all these other scriptures that we've used. And they may say, well, then why then the baptism of the Holy Ghost? I've already got everything. Well, it's true that your spirit is complete. But you can't fully release this completeness that's in your spirit without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, of course, was complete in his spirit when he was on this physical earth in his physical body. And yet there is not any recorded miracle that he did until he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, until the Holy Spirit came upon him. Some people say, so are you saying that he wasn't God? No, that's not it at all. He was God. He, the angels sang and said that he was Lord at his birth. They said, come see Christ the Lord, and they glorified him. So Jesus was born God in his spirit. But it's, I, I look at it more this way, that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're one, is what the Scripture teaches. And because they are one, they cannot operate independent of each other. The Holy Spirit is the one who releases the wisdom of God. It says that over in John chapter 14, 15, and 16. It talks about that when he has come, he will teach you all things, lead you into all truth, bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever Jesus has said unto you, John 14, 26. It says in the 15th chapter that the Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus and take of his and reveal it unto you. The wisdom and the revelation of God that is in your spirit cannot be, or you could say will not be released without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. They don't operate independent of each other. They operate in conjunction with each other. So what I'm saying is that if all these things be true about what's happened to you in your spirit, that you have the faith of the Son of God already there, you already have the mind of Christ. And yet, as I gave illustration, the wisdom that's in your spirit isn't released until you begin to start praying in tongues and drawing on this wisdom that's in your spirit. That's one of the ways. It's not the only way, but it's certainly one of the main ways. If all that be true, which it is, this just underscores how essential it is to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
This is another teaching. I have a tape entitled The Baptism of the Holy Spirit. I also have one entitled Why Speak in Tongues. It will also deal with this same thing about revelation knowledge. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just synonymous with being born again. I hadn't got time on this tape to go into all of that. You could get that tape entitled The Baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it will explain it. But there is a second or separate experience from salvation where you can receive an endowment by the Holy Spirit. And specifically, one of the gifts, not the only one, but one of the gifts that will operate is this ability to speak in tongues. And when you do that, it is much more than just something you do to prove you have the Holy Spirit. It is much more than something that you do just to give you an emotional feeling. It does say here in 1 Corinthians 14, 4, that when you pray in tongues, you edify yourself. You will build yourself up. You will receive emotional benefit from it. But it's much more than that. And one of the things that it will do is it will help release this wisdom of God that is in your spirit, the mind of Christ. And if there was no other benefit, that would certainly be enough. What a tremendous benefit to speaking in tongues. There are some denominations that emphasize that when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you speak in tongues, and they put such emphasis on that that actually that's nearly the sum total of what they teach about the benefits of speaking in tongues. So there are many people who receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues at one time, basically to prove that they had it, but didn't know that there were other benefits, and so they don't speak in tongues now, or they haven't spoken in tongues since they received the baptism, and they're missing out on one of these great benefits. I tell you, if you are listening to this tape, and you have not yet received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you need to. You either need to go to someone who has this, pray about it and go to God. You could call our helpline. We have people at our phone center in Colorado Springs from Monday through Friday, and they will certainly pray with you. They could explain this to you. They could help you order these tapes that I've mentioned about the baptism of the Holy Spirit or revelation knowledge or the one entitled Why I Speak in Tongues, and they could help give those tapes to you, but also they can pray with you, and we see many, many people baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues over our phones. So if you'd like to do that, the phone number is area code 719-635-1111. That's area code 719-635-1111, and it's open from 5 a.m. till 4.30 p.m. each weekday at Mountain Standard Time. So if you have not yet received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you need to do it. If you have received it, then you need to add to the reasons why you speak in tongues that you are you are speaking in the Spirit, that perfect mind of Christ is releasing that wisdom, the hidden wisdom of God, and then you need to do what it says in 1 Corinthians fourteen thirteen and pray that you interpret. You need to let God give you understanding of what you're saying so that it can bring this revelation knowledge that is in your spirit out into your physical body. So on this tape, we've established that you already have the faith of the Son of God. It's not a matter of not having faith. It's a matter of not knowing that you have it, not knowing the laws that it's governed by. And then you also have the mind of Christ. It's not right for us just to throw up our hands and say, well, okay, sirrah, sirrah, whatever will be, will be. I just don't understand. How can you understand the things of God? The Word of God is given to explain it. And then the Spirit within you has the mind of Christ. And as you pray over the Word of God, you can receive the revelation. You can draw it up out of you. And you don't have to walk in ignorance. You can walk in revelation knowledge. These are two areas that are some of the greatest benefits of understanding this teaching about spirit, soul, and body. On our next tape, I'm going to conclude this series, and we're going to just talk about uh, this relationship between the spirit and what the Bible calls the flesh, the conflict, and how you can begin to start letting the Spirit win instead of the flesh. We hope your heart has been quickened by hearing the Word of God through this message. It's the faithful support of people like you who make this ministry possible. We invite you to prayerfully consider becoming a partner with Andrew Womack Ministries. We maintain a website at awmi.net 
Our helpline number is 719-635-1111, or you can write us at P.O. Box 3333, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80934. Until next time, we pray that you'll reach out by faith and receive everything that's yours through God's grace.